the participants and uh, on behalf of association of otolaryngologists of india uh, i welcome you to this very important session we have uh, two very interesting uh, talks lined up today and it pertains to a very uh, uh, contemporary topic of facial endoscopy and uh, dr pp singh he doesn't need any introduction his his name is anonymous with facial endoscopy in this country and uh, he shall be talking about the contemporary use of facial endoscopy uh, in the management of uh, salivary gland pathologies and uh, where it has opened up uh, a new area or a new field uh, of minimal invasive and organ preservation uh, surgeries for the management of uh, ductal and other diseases of the salivary glands so the he'll be talking about the philosophy of uh, uh, and the paradigm shift that uh, cell endoscopy has brought into the management of salivary gland diseases and the uh, second talk will be by uh, dr rahmatullah vice ramati uh, from uh, massachusetts i and ear infirmary boston harvard medical school boston so with these uh, opening uh, remarks and uh, i hand it over to our president uh, dr hc uh, taneja for his uh, opening comments you are muted sir you have to unmute yeah thank you vipin and uh, i will not stand between the speakers and the audience so i hand over to dr pasi and dr rakesh kumar they are the chairperson for today's session so hand over to you sir thank you thank you dr neja uh, can i see dr rakesh yeah he is uh, easy uh, sir good Visible. evening very good evening uh, let us good without evening, wasting time uh, dr rakesh let us ask uh, request rather dr pp singh to start his uh, talk yes sir okay thank you dr pasi dr rakesh kumar and of course i thank the ay delhi executive uh, committee dr taneja president dr vipin secretary dr hitesh a treasurer and of course other members and uh, i uh, welcome dr rahmati uh, uh, in this talk as a co uh, faculty so i will i think straight away get to the topic as dr vipin mentioned that uh, we are going to talk today the modern management of salivary gland diseases and the paradigm shift which has happened in the treatment of these uh, diseases in last 25 or so years uh i worked in fortis hospital in delhi most of the work was done in gtb hospital and university college of medical sciences in delhi and uh, in first 10 years of our cell endoscopy program in gtb hospital we had a collaboration academic collaboration with european cell endoscopy training center and professor francis marshall and this interaction was of course very crucial to the development of cell endoscopy uh, when we started the first center dr marshall was uh, very helpful in um, coming down to delhi number of times and promoting this technique so what is of course a paradigm shift we all know the paradigm the definition of paradigm the paradigm is basically an established way of uh, doing a particular thing or a frame of reference and this frame of reference is established over a period of time which is dependent on so many underlying assumption underlying facts underlying uh, proofs and when there is a shift again uh, this shift is brought about by changes in all these aspects of that paradigm if you go by the dictionary meaning of paradigm shift it is basically a fundamental change in approach and in this case we are talking about managing the salivary gland diseases is basically the change in philosophy about uh, 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 proceeding with the management of uh, the disease spectrum of salivary gland paradigm shift also could mean the change in the underlying assumptions and as we will see in this presentation how the assumption on which the old paradigm was based has also shifted to a new paradigm and of course third paradigm shift which i'll be talking about is 
relating to the technique of gland excision and uh, that will be the last part of my presentation uh, well we have two paradigms of course we have to have the the uh, frame of reference which is the old one and we will use the past as prelude to this presentation as you see that salivary gland disease is basically present to us in these two glands in these uh, pair of uh, two glands, the parotid glands and submandibular glands. Of course, there are diseases relating to other salivary glands, sublingual and minor, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'll be only dealing with major salivary gland. And my context basically will be submandibular gland to avoid confusion. And we will, in the end, we will, of course, talk about a bit about parotid gland, how it differs from submandibular um, management. We, we all know the spectrum of pathology and mostly this is acute and chronic cellulitis, which is uh, uh, applicable to both the uh, glands here. The tumors, which are much more common in parotid than some mandibular. And trauma, again, uh, which is, of course, it's rare, but uh, out of these, it's more common in parotid gland rather than uh, some mandibular because of the exposed um, area that is very close to the parotid gland. And we also know, uh, most of us ENT surgeons know how it presents. Mostly you will have an acute presentation. You will have swelling, pain, fever. There could be purulent discharge from the ostium. There could even be an abscess. There could even be a fistula. And the swelling mostly are tender because of inflammation. And we know the standard treatment of antibiotics and analgesics and fermentation maybe aspiration of abscess or incision uh, drainage of these abscesses. So this is all well standardized and uh, it was being done earlier also, it's being done now also. Uh, the issue was uh, uh, always the recurrent disease because if the acute stage did subside with antibiotics uh, and it came back again, you could treat it two, three times, but ultimately if this was a recurrent disease and uh, especially in cases where you start having mealtime syndrome where you uh, have the swelling and pain when you uh, eat. So these were the cases which um, you had to treat differently because patient was inconvenienced. And the uh, solution to this, pro this problem, or in fact, even the cases of acute saladinitis which had come to you in follow-up, how to work them up so that they don't get further attacks. So if in all these cases, you will of course do the examination and the oral cavity. And if you find any uh, visible stone, the established paradigm in these stone, in these visible stones of course was incision on the stone. And if it was very near to the punctum, then you could do papillotomy. If you could not see the stone, but you could feel the stone on palpation, then also the established paradigm was giving a stab in season and getting onto the stone. But in recurrent attacks, when you could not find the pathology visible or palpable anteriorly, you had no pathology, let us say, which was discernible on inspection or palpation, but patients still had problem. Or even if you had a pathology, let us say, in the hilar area, which was felt deep in the posteriorly in the floor of mouth, and like it was not amenable to uh, surgery, uh, especially in those situations, earlier situations. So gland removal was ultimately offered to the patient. And patients usually did not, uh, usually didn't have to be convinced about it because the pathology was very evident. They could see the swelling in the submandibular area. It was coming again and again. It was corresponding to that pain and swelling. So they, they, they did not actually require any convincing for removal of this gland. And gland was removed in such situations in most of the cases. This was the most common surgery for cyanidinitis, recurrent attacks. And stones were the most common pathology in these excised glands, which uh, on dissection could be um, uh, seen. And this is how we stood for almost 100 years in 20th century. The, the, this was the established protocol. This was, you can call it an old paradigm. 
you could call it an gland centric paradigm because most of the time you are focused on the gland no not of course in 10% cases you as i showed you that invisible stones palpable stones you could still preserve the gland but in 90% of the cases you had to remove the gland and this was uh, based on this assumption this this gland removal was propped up by this assumption that this gland is irreversibly uh, uh, damaged or in, uh, infected and histopathology of course of such excised glands obviously we come as uh, and claimed uh, the signs of chronic inflammation because pathology was still there so these glands were removed for almost 100 years and uh, they had their own uh, complications and one of them of course was marginal mandibular nerve i think we have who have been doing this gland excision have come across this complication uh, you had a scar which sometimes was not uh, even perceptible sometimes it was very uh, bad and prominent and seen but some cases like this particular patient was more concerned with this fossa which uh, was created after the uh, gland excision uh, rather than the scar itself so he, he patients had different perceptions about their complication this is a fistula which uh, happened after the removal of the gland maybe because of uh, incomplete removal or a persistent pathology and in cases where you are doing intraoral procedures like uh, in season of the on the stone or uh, you are doing uh, stab in seasons you you because of the the crowded anatomy of this area of floor of mouth as you can see here graph uh, i mean superimposed you have the lingual nerve which is uh, intertwined with uh, the wartans duct which goes under this salivary uh, sublingual gland so you could could face when you are doing stab in season most of them would be blind because you will feel the stone you will give a stab and you probably might even go through sublingual gland you might even injure the lingual nerve and you might even transect the wartans duct if you are uh, this was twisted or something and this injury to sublingual gland could lead to ranula injury to wartans duct could lead to stenosis so all these complications were were Uh, present for all these procedures but uh, this was basically a, a, a standard of care in, in because there was no other um, uh, alternative available like you had to do intra oral surgery or you had to remove the gland and that was the standard of care and as i said this is what we call the old paradigm the 20th century paradigm and we the surgeons live lived with this uh, duality uh, this compulsion it was a compulsion to to live in this duality because you you always thought that these glands are irreversibly damaged and that's how you justified the removal of these glands but you also knew that the pathology when in the duct and when the pathology is removed these glands they started functioning normally as you would know from the outcomes of these cases so this was because the pathology in uh, quite a number of cases were unknown or it was inaccessible even if you knew there is a stone in hylum and still uh, we knew that uh, the probably it cannot be removed or there are complications of stab going that far behind in the form of lingual nerve paralysis so it was unknown and inaccessible inaccessible the pathology and this restoring the duct patency leading to resolution of symptoms uh, as was proved in those 10% of cases of intraoral procedures also formed the basis of cell endoscopy so it was just a question of uh, various i would say the uh, uh, things happening in 1995 and uh, most of it was that the diagnosis started getting known by the ct scan or when the cell endoscope was developed you could actually do diagnostics and get on to the the the, the diagnosis or the, the pathology so once we started accessing knowing the pathology by either of these means mri ct scan and uh, the accessibility of this pathology uh, with the cell endoscope 
I think the paradigm shift started. And in 1995, uh, we, we kind of, uh, the cell endoscope was introduced. So these are some of the pictures which show you how uh, in detail you can know the uh, pathology uh, uh, and uh, beforehand and then proceed with the procedure. You could do diagnostic and uh, uh, diagnose the structures which hitherto were a kind of human unknown because uh, no, no, no diagnostic procedure, let us say, in um, the middle of the century could, could diagnose these uh, pathologies. And even with that, and with diagnostic, even small tumors, interductal tumors or polyps, they could be visualized. They probably would not be picked up by MRI scan or any other. Um, modality of uh, diagnosis, but with diagnostic cell endoscopy, we could now were able to address these problems. And once this pathology became known and accessible, as you can see, this, this is a variety of pathology. You could have both the pathology simultaneously, the structure stone, you could have in GRP, black rent, uh, juvenile parotitis, the changes in the duct um, color, etc., multiple stone. So you have plethora of uh, these problems. And Dr. Francis Marshall in Geneva uh, put in a, a major part of his academic life in developing this technique and uh, instruments. And uh, with, of course, uh, the company called Stores, they developed all these forceps, baskets, laser fibers, balloons, etc., to enter, to access the pathology in the duct and then address it. Even the pathology, like which were in the duct, which obviously would mean that they were in the gland, they were intraglandular, they could be addressed now because even if you are not able to basket them, you still could uh, put the laser there and uh, break them and uh, bring out the pieces or, uh, or the smaller pieces could be uh, even left there for them to get spontaneously expressed. You had complicated situations like these where you had a band, this is stone in the hilum, and you have a band in front of that. So you can kind of with laser, you can break this band and then stone can be brought out. Or even if the stone is larger, you can still uh, laserize it and uh, remove it. But then there are some problems which could not be addressed by pure endoscopic procedure like large hilum stone. These were the stones which were too large for them to be brought uh, anteriorly because of the diameter of the duct. And uh, for these stones, of course, uh, you had uh, the, uh, uh, those pioneers developed other uh, techniques. One of them was this lithotriptor. Uh, lithotriptor. Uh, I will not talk about it because I have no experience, but we all know that this can break the stones into smaller parts, which can be brought out by either uh, uh, basket or probably some of them would be expelled. And then these techniques were developed, which is uh, called the combined approach uh, technique. It's uh, of course used for both uh, parotid as well as uh, some mandibular gland. I think I would rather say that this has become uh, more helpful in parotid cases vis-a-vis uh, -vis some mandibular, uh, because those were the stones with uh, the, the pathologies and parotid which were never addressed. So at least in some mandibular gland, you had that option, ultimate option of removing the gland. But when, in, when it came to parotid, that parotidectomy was, I would say, never done because both patient and uh, doctor were afraid of facial and it was kind of a neglected disease. So we, uh, in some mandibular gland, we mostly have a stone a pathology. There are multiple stones, single stone. So 75% of pathology in some mandibular gland is uh, the stones. And of course, some cases you have stricture like in this. The strictures can now be, of course, treated. I think Dr. MT will be talking in detail. I just want to say that there has been a paradigm shift even in the treatment of uh, uh, these pathologies and combined pathologies where you dilate the structure and remove the stone. Now, second thing is uh, the, the change in the underlying assumption. And as I told you, uh, that was a false assumption earlier that it was irreversibly damaged. But now the data amply shows the imaging studies, the technician studies, the outcome data, they all show that 
um, uh, most of these glands come back to normal and start functioning normally and start producing saliva. And how has uh, this affected the, the patients? You know, ultimately, what has been the impact of cell endoscopy on the patients? And I give you this example of uh, this lady who had stones on both the sides, submandibular gland, this in the duct, a small stone, large stone hilum on the left side. She underwent stab, stab uh, or, uh, on the right side, uh, patient did, the stone could not be removed. The gland was excised ultimately. And then that was the stage, uh, no, this was the right side, wherein you see the scar and the fossa. Unfortunately, uh, she did not have any nerve palsy, etc. And then after that gland excision, um, she underwent left uh, uh, internal procedure, left stab incision for hyaluronic stone, which again failed. And that this is the stage where she came to GTB hospital. And we did the combined approach and of course remove the gland. And this is the post-op CT of uh, this patient, which shows the presence of stone in the right side, still there where the gland had, has been removed but you, you don't see the stone on the left side where only the cell endoscopic procedure was done and the gland is intact. So you can see the contrast that in the old 20th paradigm, uh, uh, 20th century paradigm, you had problem of scar and multiple surgery and uh, the fossa she been complaining of. And on the other side, which is called the cell endoscopic paradigm, you see that it was a minimally invasive technique wherein the pathology was uh, removed positively and the, uh, the, the outcome was a functioning gland. So a gland was saved, a functioning gland was saved and there were no complications. So this is how we uh, stood uh, or rather we stand at this time. I'm talking from experience of uh, 17 years, we started cell endoscopy in GTV hospital in 2005, and uh, we, we, we've done more than 3,000 intervention, interventions uh, in that institute alone. Of course, we are continuing the same work in Fortis Hospital. Now, I want to draw your attention here that in spite of all these techniques of cell endoscopic removal with basket or forceps, uh, intraoral uh, in seasons, stab in seasons, uh, lasers, external lithotripsy, robotics, etc. You still end up with 10% of cases which are not resolved. And what do you do with them? Of course, when everything has failed, the gland needs to be removed. And for me, this has been a spin off of cell endoscopy because that gave me enough experience of working when we were doing combined approach. Uh, and, and for the hyaluronic stones, that definitely gave us a lot of experience about the detailed anatomy of this area, and and I would say the maneuverability of the instruments in this area. It's a very tight area, no doubt. And uh, this is how uh, you give the incision and reach on to the gland here. This is myeloid muscle. This is the right side. This is the tongue. So if you see carefully, you can already see the submandibular gland in the, the, in the bottom. And the stones are usually found here, the hyaluronic stones. Of course, this case was of a stone. But let us presume that we were not able to remove this stone. Then what do you do? So obviously, the logic says that uh, since the gland is in front of you and it has already been dissected, almost half the section has been done while trying to find the hyaluronic area, so it's only logical that we remove the, the, the gland by further dissection. And in situations like this, the, the hyaluronic parenchymal stones, uh, which, this is a gland of the same patient uh, I showed you the CT. So this is somehow the situation where you have the hilum, then it gets, uh, uh, you have this opening and you have a stone which is in the gland. So this is a kind of partially seen in the hilum, but uh, uh, majorly in the gland. So this is how uh, we uh, we started doing intraoral submandibular gland excision. Of course, it was mentioned in 1960s as the first report, but no mention of it uh, after that, except I think in 1997 again. So for more than 30 years, nobody uh, talked about this technique. So we give the same incision as I told you. We uh, have to be careful. We have to 
there will be sub there will be lingual now here just uh, below the mucosa you have to be very careful that you you separate it out to release it from the the gland totally so that it does not get pulled and you uh, dissect this the myelohyoid muscle of the uh, gland area and then you dissect the gland from the uh, hyoglossus muscle which is deeper down and uh, there you will find uh, so ultimately you uh, release the uh, soft tissue and uh, you then have the gland out and uh, and in the bottom you will see the lingual nerve this is the hypoglossal nerve on the hyoglossus muscle this is digastric as you remember when doing external approach it, you will see the hypoglossal nerve just running uh, under the, the parallel and under to the uh, the, the, the uh, belly of the digestic and uh, this is where the myelohyoid is which has been detected and then you suture it and uh, so um, uh, yeah this is the gland in one piece but sometimes it does come in uh, multiple pieces which is i think no big deal as uh, as long as you have been able to remove it in total and these are the cases where you it's mandatory because sometimes you don't find any pathology. This probably could be cases of tertiary ductal strictures where, which are difficult to diagnose and uh, you don't uh, see anything else and patients has problem of uh, swelling and pain and obviously these are the patients which will need gland removal. I, I only, uh, I mean, to the, the, the juniors and of course anybody listening to me now that please shift over to intraoral gland excisions rather than external work. This was a patient uh, who came with the some mandibular gland stone as you can see here, a large stone posteriorly situated not here in the hilum or in the duct. This was not seen on cell endoscopy because it was intraglandular. It was so superficial that it, the stone could be felt from outside as well. And we remove the gland and you can see there is no stone there. And this is a patient, no scar, nothing, not even fossa. I mean, at least uh, even if there was, it was so minimal that patient did not complain of that. So our experience with intraglandular removal of submandibular stones of cases, which are either not uh, amenable for cell endoscopic procedures uh, or the pathology is not known. So we have a series of 21 cases done this is earlier data we have added some more to it and i will not talk about because of shortage of time we'll be talking that these are basically high low current uh, stones and chronic saladinitis of uh, the cause unknown or uh, strictures and three cases are pleomorphic adenoma because when we started the center a lot of cases started coming usually you will find some mandibular pleomorphic adenoma to be very rare but somehow we got three cases we we did these cases with some mandibular gland excision intraorally. And this is the data outcome which I want to draw your attention to. And the most important, I think, is that in none of these cases we had marginal mandibular. In fact, this nerve is uh, away from the area of dissection. So uh, logically, it, it cannot be damaged. The lingual nerve paresis was in all 18 cases, uh, which we ultimately did, who were abandoned or uh, converted to external because of whatever reason. All of these fully recovered, one taking almost six months. And the last area which recovers is the tip of the tongue, as, as you know from other cases as well. Hypoglossal nerve, we had one case of paralysis, which fully recovered. Most of people would ask me, what do you do with facial artery or facial vessel? And uh, it's strange for me to say that uh, I have seen this vessel in this cohort of 21 cases only once. Uh, it was never seen. Probably it gets stripped off the gland when you are dissecting that capsule because you're coming from inside out and not from outside in, wherein we see the vessels first and then, you know, you have to separate them out. It takes roughly one and a half hours, maybe less nowadays, but roughly it, uh, I will say this one. We have stopped doing the pleomorphic adenomas, uh, tumors of some mandibular gland, because in all these three, the tumor ruptured, and obviously there must have been some uh, uh, you know, uh, small pieces uh, um, 
So on there, of course, none of these cases have been not followed to know whether there was any vector. Of course, needless to say, there was no scar, minor complications like the pain and the... So the key points, I think I have last two slides. The key point is that the, the reverse anatomy is reversed when you're doing this procedure. Lingual nerve may lie very, very superficial. You can see this. You can see the nerve in, underneath the mucosa. So when you're cutting it here, you want to be very careful. Now, and of course, there are other things which again, uh, as I said, two cases we had to convert to external. So what do we do with them? So it's a full circle, we go and do externally. But of course, not that I am doing it, but we have resort to endoscopic surgery. You have resort to robotic surgery, which can be even used intraorally as well uh, in difficult situations, but we don't have access. And of course, externally as well, uh, I have no experience with it. I again have no experience of Botox uh, in uh, some mandibular, I mean, in this. Now, the parotid, I will not talk except to say that parotid, uh, parotid acne was not done for these uh, cases of recurrent parotitis, a reason I told you. So, these patients were doomed to suffer for very, very long uh, period of time. The difference is that the duct is much smaller. Uh, you have a mesetric turn in the uh, parotid duct, which makes it a bit uh, difficult to maneuver. The disease spectrum is varied. You have more stricture than glands, and strictures are always difficult to manage. Uh, you have, this is a stricture in parotid in our data. You can see majority of them are stricture. So I come to the end and uh, say that we uh, had been lucky to have association with the European Center and uh, Dr. Francis Marshall. Uh, we had been uh, interacting with them during their courses uh, in Geneva and they had been uh, coming to uh, New Delhi for uh, courses. Uh, we did not keep it uh, to us. We started sharing this. This first workshop was done in 2009 uh, where Dr. Marshall had come. And then we subsequently kept on doing these workshops uh, till I was there at JTB hospital. So the, I just want to say that the paradigm shift has happened in the management of salivary gland diseases. Unfortunately, it has not touched the landscape. The, 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 the majority of uh, areas where uh, you know, people in India live, so they probably don't have access to this, this new technology. And probably the, the surgeons or the surgeons in those areas uh, are not trained to be uh, doing these procedures. So uh, probably these patients are undergoing the gland resection uh, as I speak. But then it obviously can be uh, taken against anyone because uh, you have to invest a lot of money and sometimes the government uh, resources are not enough to bring in this, this kind of technology. So I would say majority of cases we, we still do in India with old paradigm and 10% uh, maybe, maybe 10, 15% we do, do with this new paradigm. And I hope that this 10% reaches 90% or something. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, as I, I think Dr. Vipin has said that the question will be taken in that. Okay, over to you, Dr. Pansi, Dr. Rakesh. Dr. Pasi, please unmute yourself. Yeah, I agree with Dr. P.P. Singh uh, that in India, we still do not have a high percentage of uh, patient undergoing with the, this latest technology. But uh, I hope uh, over a period of time, we will also have the silent endoscopy uh, equipment and the trained uh, ENT surgeons uh, to work uh, with this technique. Uh, Dr. Rakesh, please. Uh, Sir, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor P.P. Singh, uh, we all know that uh, because of him, we, we all started doing silo endoscopy. Yeah. And he was the uh, 
uh, the the person who was instrumental in 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 popularizing the cello endoscopy at least in 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 northern part of india uh, uh, as we all know the 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 international uh, lecture series the the uh, initiative by the ay delhi branch is a excellent learning uh, uh, opportunity and uh, today we have the ex- uh, the topic which is uh, uh, really important and which can really make difference in the life of the patient as well as a uh, surgeon is uh, cello endoscopy uh, it is my honor that on behalf of ay delhi to uh, uh, introduce the next speaker dr dr rahmatullah vice uh, vice rahmati he is a member of the faculty in otolaryngology and head and neck surgery harvard medical school and he is physician and surgeon uh, massachusetts i and ear hospital dr uh, vice rahmati is a board certified otolaryngologist and head and neck surgeon at um, at at the massachusetts i and ear hospital he is he is a surgeon in the comprehensive ent division and is one of the few surgeon in united states who performed office based cello endoscopy using local anesthesia he was specially recruited to to um, uh, mass eye and ear to develop a state of art cutting edge program in the cello endoscopy prior to his joining the harvard medical school as faculty he, he was the part of faculty at yale university and and columbia university he is the recipient of numerous patient care award and resident teaching award which few of which are new york top doctors rising star shane uh, shelly resident teaching award and the maxwell uh, abramson memorial award for the excellence in teaching and service dr uh, dr rahmati's clinical interest includes salivary gland diseases including cello endoscopy head and neck surgery and oncology and obstructive sleep apnea it is over to dr uh, dr rahmatullah vice uh, uh, vice rahmati sir please Thank you Dr. Kumar for that very kind introduction and uh I would like to thank the uh, organizing committee for allowing me to participate in these lectures series so uh, it's quite an honor to be here with you and I want to uh you know acknowledge Dr. Singh's wonderful presentation on the paradigm shift of cell endoscopy uh that was really a, a wonderful talk and for me it, it you know there's a number of learning points in particular I I found it fascinating at uh, how you uh remove the gland intraorally so certainly something that i want to look into myself so i'm just going to bring up my presentation and indeed you know cell endoscopy has definitely been a a paradigm shift in my own practice in the last 10 years that i've been pre- uh, performing this procedure um i've only removed six salivary glands so uh, it's it's really worked well in uh, how i've been able to manage uh the care of obstructive salivary gland disease uh for my patients. So can you see my slide deck here? Yeah, yes. yeah. We we can see. Mm. Okay, fantastic. So I was asked to talk about basically the outcomes uh as it relates to cell endoscopy and and ways of uh sort of uh improving results. So I, that that'll be the focus of my talk. I have nothing to disclose for this. I'd like to start off by basically just talking about how we, you know, what are the keys to success when when dealing with anything uh, that that comes across for us and in in particular in this in the context of obstructive salivary gland disease, you have to understand the disease, understand the surgery, and you should understand your patient. So in terms of disease, it's pretty straightforward. Uh most obstructive salivary gland pathology presents with pain and swelling of the gland. Some patients complain of dry mouth. and uh some patients have recurrent infections uh 80% of submandibular gland disease is due to um stone obstruction whereas 
probably 80% of parotid obstructive disease is due to stenotic disease of the ductal system. In terms of surgery, uh, one should understand what are the, uh, the limitations of, of the technology uh, as it relates to sal endoscopy. Uh, it, uh, after all, it's, it's simply a tool, but it's a tool that you know, allows us to visualize a ductal system like we've never done before, but it may not apply in all situations. So having that understanding and explaining it to your patient uh, allows for a better outcome uh, as, as you're uh, going through the process of figuring out what is the best way to um, correct or treat a particular obstructive uh, condition for your patient. And then you should understand your patient, of course. Uh, what are their particular needs? Uh, oftentimes patients come in and they have a large hyalur stone and it's in the context of an incidental finding on a dental x-ray. They are completely asymptomatic, so they don't necessarily need anything done. Or they may have had many years of recurrent symptoms, which are mild, and they are not necessarily interested in, um, in having an invasive procedure, albeit it might be minimally invasive. So these are things that one needs to consider as they're um, you know, going through the process of uh, establishing a care plan for their patient. So in this, in this slide, there are a variety of stones in different uh, locations and sizes. And if you look at the left column, these are the stones that are typically ideal for sal endoscopy. And in my particular practice, sal endoscopy in the office. They're very tiny stones, anywhere from two to three millimeters in size. The, two, the second and third columns have large size stones, multiple size stones, and these are amenable to uh, sal endoscopy assisted approaches. Uh, approaches where perhaps you may be able to capture uh, the stone with a basket and bring it closer to the papilla to reduce the size of the incision. Or in this, in this particular uh, case right here, which I just did the other day, the larger stone needs to be approached with a you know, direct sialolithotomy, but then there's a smaller hyalur stone where um, a, a sialolithotomy approach would not be you know, amenable to, uh, and uh, sal endoscopy may allow uh, ultimate retrieval. The two cases here at, uh, at the right are, are cases that, are, that have large hyalur stones and oftentimes uh, a direct sialolithotomy transorally is all that's needed. Now, again, I, would uh, I, I offer patients a gland sparing approach uh, transorally to avoid gland excision. Um, as I explained to them, and as Dr. Singh mentioned, this is a reversible process. If that gland wasn't functional, there is data that shows that removal of the stone will um, allow ultimate uh, return of function over a period of time. So uh, as we all know, each of these submandibular glands produce a third of our saliva at baseline. So to, to quickly remove a gland and uh, not try to consider alternative options, gland sparing options would be a disservice to patients if, if not available, uh, if, if, you know, in, this, in the setting where perhaps uh, sal endoscopy or uh, an approach uh, interorally could be offered to the patient. This small, uh, this picture at the, at the bottom here on the, uh, on the right is of a large parotid stone. And as Dr. Singh also alluded to, these are ideal for a combined sal endoscopy transfacial approaches. So I wanna show you this one video of a patient who underwent sal endoscopy in the office. So she's wide awake, uh, a very small amount of local anesthesia is needed. Um, my initial approach for all of these cases is to access the papilla with a guide wire, usually inject a very small amount of um, lidocaine with epinephrine, well under uh, one cc, and then sequentially dilate the papilla with these salivary duct dilators that range in size between four and seven French. I typically use the larger sal endoscope, the 1.6 millimeter as a, uh, for, for stone retrieval. So uh, for, for that size scope, a, a seven French salivary duct dilator is typically dil uh, required. Alternatively, there are, you can use the uh, non-disposable bougie set that, uh, that is offered with the uh, sal endoscopy set. So this is the, 1.6 millimeter scope, and you'll notice that there are little markings there that uh, signify one centimeter uh, of length from the scope. 
And this is a uh, introductory view of that, uh, of, that uh, of the stone with some surrounding salivary sludge. For these larger appearing stones, I like to use an open facing basket to grab it from the, from the front, as opposed to encompassing the stone. And then here it's small enough that it does not require a papillotomy. So this is, I think, like the, the perfect situation for solid endoscopy, uh, something that is two to three millimeters in size. It can be done in the office and oftentimes in less than 15 minutes. Patient comes in and does not require anything uh, further. So the benefits of uh, endoscopic or uh, in, in particular salivary gland surgery are that they are gland sparing. Uh, it's minimally invasive. You're using normal anatomy to access the duct. Uh, by doing so, you're also preserving the normal anatomy. Uh, it is a diagnostic tool through direct visualization of the, uh, of the duct. It, there is less pain, less risk. It's scarless, faster recovery. It can be done in an outpatient setting. It could be an option for the medically frail. Patients can continue their anticoagulation if... Uh, an incision is not necessary, and it comes at a reduced cost. The benefits of office-based silent endoscopy include convenience. Patients do not need to be NPO. There's a shorter procedure time. Uh, there's a shorter post-procedure recovery time. My patients often stay in the office for five minutes, and then uh, they're ready to go home. And they can go home alone. It, it makes it a lot easier for them. Uh, and then there's the benefits from a cost perspective, both for the patient and the institution. In this one particular study, the cost of in-office cell endoscopy on average was $700 versus $14,000 for the same patient going into the operating room. There was also a significant decrease in, in procedure time, surgical time in the office versus the operating room time. Some of the disadvantages of office-based cell endoscopy include inadequate anesthesia, the patient may be uncomfortable. It requires patient cooperation. And there's the potential for airway concern, especially if you were to uh, do a procedure more, more in the posterior floor or mouth. Some of the relevant cell endoscopy anatomy uh, as it relates to submandibular duct papilla, it's found in the medial end of the sublingual fold. It ranges between 0.1 and 0.5 millimeters in diameter. The submandibular duct itself has an average diameter of two millimeters and then the length between five and seven centimeters. The parotid duct papilla is usually found opposite to the second maxillary molar. Its diameter is usually 0.5 millimeters. And the parotid duct itself, the diameter is on average 1.5 millimeters, and the length can be between five and seven centimeters as well. And from a, a transoral uh, appro approach and considerations in terms of anatomy, as Dr. Singh uh, illustrated uh, nicely with, with his slides, the lingual nerve and the sublingual gland have to be considered when you're doing a transoral sialolithotomy to remove a larger stone. And then with the, uh, with the transfacial approaches for parotid gland stones, buccal branch uh, of the facial nerve needs to be considered. So sial endoscopy has two benefits. One, as I mentioned earlier, it's diagnostic, allows direct visualization of the ductal anatomy and allows identification of introductal pathology such as stones, strictures, mucus plugging, cellular debris, and introductal inflammation. It's also therapeutic because when you identify these introductal abnormalities, at the same time, you may be able to treat it, remove smaller stones, dilate strictures, wash out mucus plugs, and irrigate with uh, steroid for inflammation. Uh, the wide range of minimally invasive techniques around silent endoscopy include a pure silent endoscopy alone approach or with perhaps with lith lithotripsy, uh, we use laser here in the United States as uh, pneumatic and uh, shockwave lithotripsy is not, uh, has not been approved by the FDA. And then there are combined approaches, uh, approaches that are either transoral or transbuccal, transfacial for the parotid gland. And some centers are also using robotic assisted cell endoscopy. The indications are uh, from a diagnostic perspective, if there is any suspicion for obstructive salivary gland disease, an interventional sal endoscopy for salivary stones, salivary stenosis, RAI-related sal adenitis, Sjogren's-related salivary gland disease, juvenile recurrent parotitis, 
The relative contraindication is acute cell adenitis as there's a higher risk of ductal injury. Anesthetic choice. Uh, the mainstay is general anesthesia here in the United States, but it can also be done under monitored anesthesia care. This is a, general, a level of general anesthesia without intubation, local anesthesia with sedation, and just plain local anesthesia. I do two thirds of my cases in the office under plain local anesthesia. These are mostly uh, diagnostic cases or small stones in the submandibular gland. So patient selection is critical, and these can be determined based on patient factors and disease factors. In terms of patient factors, in, as it relates to the choice of general uh, choice of anesthetic, typically for general anesthesia, if the patient is concerned about pain or anxiety, and if they have unfavorable anatomy and they may have uh, medical comorbidities, probably general anesthesia is the way to go. Of course, with that comes, you know, the typical uh, sort of preoperative planning, the, the experience that goes with undergoing general anesthesia with intubation and the postoperative experience of the potential for postoperative nausea, vomiting, uh, post-anesthesia effects. On the other side, in terms of local anesthetic, if patients are Again, if they are uh, concerned about pain and anxiety, it's not the way to go for them. Uh, so it would, you know, it would be an, less optimal in, in in those patients. But in terms of convenience, uh, the the preoperative prep, the postoperative experience, it's it's all positive, and it has been positive for these patients. Cost is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, lower, uh, but you need favorable anatomy. In terms of disease factors, if we look at it from a stone and a non-stone perspective. When you're looking at patients or selecting patients who are to undergo local anesthesia, it is best if the stones are small, less than five millimeters. Uh, a distal duct location is ideal, but certainly if they are smaller and mobile stones anywhere within the ductal system uh, is fine. A round or oval shaped stone and single stones are, are best if you're approaching it uh, via a, uh, with local anesthesia. And then of course, larger stones proximally located or hilar stones, uh, irregular shaped multiple stones uh, are best probably considered under general anesthesia. In terms of non-stone disease, uh, I, I look at it in terms of the number of glands and whether or not there is a uh, concern for autoimmune disease. Uh, typically uh, patients with multi-gland involvement with concerns for Sjogren's, these are best done under general anesthesia but that being said, I've started to notice that a lot of patients actually tolerate these procedures well in the office, and I've been offering it to them as well in the office if, if that was desired. Once you try to manage patient expectations, so every, they, you know they, they are uh, comfortable with what they're getting and what uh, the potential outcomes are. So in terms of office-based cell endoscopy, I, I, I often offer it uh, from a diagnostic perspective or for stones that are small. Uh, patients often also ask, will there be uh, an incision or can you do it without an incision? I let them know that a small incision like a papillotomy may be needed for stones that are over three millimeters in size and certainly stones that are greater than five millimeters or, and, and not in a, a uh, sort of a distal duct location, these patients will need a hybrid approach with a larger scar. Uh, patients coming in with complaints of dry mouth well, I, there, certainly in the absence of stone disease, uh, I, you know, one must inform them that their symptoms may not improve, especially in terms of uh, autoimmune related uh, xerostomia uh, and, and, and more so if multiple glands are involved. And then of course we discuss the complications. I tell the patients, if we can't get into the duct, we can't do the procedure. That being said, a sialodochotomy is certainly possible uh, in terms of access but I, I try to use the natural duct ostium to get in in most cases. Uh, ductal injuries is a possibility, infection, bleeding, uh, persistent and recurrent symptoms. But these are all, in terms of actual injury to the duct or infection and bleeding, is well under 5%. From uh, an approach of uh, silent endoscopy used with, uh, in combination with an appro open approach for the submandibular gland, advise them that uh, lingual nerve injury is possible, ranula formation when, uh, is a possibility. And then for uh, trans uh, facial approaches uh, for, for the parotid gland, facial nerve injury, as well as sialocele and salivary fistulas. And ultimately some percentage of patients do need a gland incision, probably around 5%.
Uh, these are the, this is the style endoscope. This is the, the workhorse uh, style endoscope with uh, size 1.6, but they range between 0.8 uh, millimeters, uh, 1.1 and 1.3. And then uh, the working channel of this particular scope accommodates all the instruments except for the balloon. Guide wire is essential to getting access. And uh, you know I, I find it absolutely indispensable uh, to get in as well as maintaining access. Uh, salivary duct dilator, and then a, a couple of different types of baskets here. Uh, this is just a basic setup in the office, pretty simple. I use the probes at times as well to access the duct. Uh, this style endoscopy technique is pretty basic. Uh, and we, we discussed the anesthesia uh, options and, and deciding how what is uh, best under different circumstances. The key really is accessing the papilla and dilating it safely to allow evaluation and inter intervention with the cell endoscope. So some of the technical considerations I want to go over uh, that will hopefully lead to uh, a successful uh, cell endoscopy outcome. Uh, consider the anatomy. So again, you need to access the, uh, access the duct to be able to, to do the procedure. Uh, it's going to be difficult with patients who have trismus, uh, prominent mandibular tori, uh, sort of uh, teeth uh, that are high in length, uh, or, or height, uh, it can be obstructive uh, uh, potentially. Uh, scarring from prior sialolithotomy uh, uh, it can be uh, a challenge and uh, may preclude the ability to do sial endoscopy. Dilated papilla, and sometimes if you uh, look under, uh, under the microscope, a dilated papilla may uh, be a sign that a prior stone has, uh, or a stone has previously extruded. So it may have left uh, a scar in its tracts. Uh, hypervascular mucosa around the papilla can result in bleeding. So one should be mindful of that. Uh, some patients have very thin mucosa and uh, during the dilation process, it, there can be disruption between the duct and the, uh, and the surrounding mucosa such that entry into the duct is nearly impossible. And, uh, and then of course there are those patients who've had previous gland excision but have retained stones. So uh, you don't have the flow of saliva to, um, to allow you identification of the duct that, that easily. So these are all considerations to be, uh, to be mindful of. And then uh, I can't sort of re reiterate this enough, but once you get access, at least for me, I, I want to maintain access and that's uh, via uh, keeping the, the, the guide wire in place will allow, uh, allow that uh, uh, to be maintained. Some additional uh, technical consideration uh, as it relates to disease, um, I always want to know is, is a stone palpable? Uh, and if so, where is the stone? Is it, uh, is it distal, mid duct, hilar region? Uh, any stone that is palpable, I follow up with uh, a CT scan to assess its size, um, look for other stones. There could be multiple stones as well as confirm location as this will help uh, plan um, a sort of a combined approach what is the location and severity of the stenosis? Uh, if, if possible, the use of different size scopes will allow uh, determination of the percentage of duct ductal stenosis. Um, can a stent be placed? A uh, stent is better for distal or short segment stenosis. Um, you wanna have normal duct proximally to prevent occlusion of the stent. So if you have a stenotic duct that is diffuse, it is very challenging to, st to stent those patients. And oftentimes probably best not to stent those patients. And then I sometimes I consider a stage approach. So uh, diagnostically evaluate the patient in the office in, in preparation for more uh, involved uh, therapies in the operating room, such as uh, with laser or, um, or more aggressive dilation approaches with balloons in the operating rooms followed with stenting. Uh, technical considerations as it relates to the uh, instruments. This is uh, the other day we had this 0.8 millimeter scope. Uh, we opened up the case and noticed this kink. So a normal scope view should see all the, micro, uh, the fiber optic fibers in this sort of perfect uh, homogeneous pattern. And then here on the right, you can see that it's been cracked. So uh, th these uh, scopes are very expensive and they're very fragile. So um, Everyone in the care team needs to be instructed on maintaining, uh, you know, maintaining these instruments with care and ideally um, 
especially for patients who are undergoing procedures in the operating room, having backup instruments are critical uh, so that they, un they don't undergo unnecessary general anesthesia only to find out that the scope uh, is, is not functional. Um, getting into some more details in terms of accessing the papilla, magnification is key. Uh, loops will do, but I use a microscope and 95% of the time I can get into the duct within 30 seconds. Uh, so if an micro operating microscope is available, definitely the way to go. Uh, you can compare the location of the papilla to the contralateral side. Um, they, they are often mirror images of each other, milking the gland or uh, massaging the gland or milking the duct to ex express some saliva will allow visualization of the papilla at times. Um, Seldinger technique with the guy wire, as I mentioned. Sometimes if none of that works, injecting the peripapillary mucosa gives some tension and actually helps visualization of the, of the papilla. So um, uh, that, that can be tried. Uh, there is some description of using methylene blue to visualize the papilla. Uh, I, I would advise avoid, uh, avoiding the use of tooth forceps as they can be a problem and create the appearance of uh, a false uh, papilla. Additionally, if ever, if the papilla uh, in particular of the submandibular uh, gland is accessed and you can't advance the, the, the probe beyond one to two centimeters, it's quite possible you may be within the sublingual papilla or duct. So uh, it's, it just be very careful and uh, not try to dilate that uh, as uh, you can uh, create a false passage. And uh, just dilate the papilla, not the entire duct. Uh, so uh, with any of these probes or dilators, you, you need to just go in um, half a centimeter or a centimeter at most, just, to, just enough to accommodate the scope. And again, I'll mention maintaining access. So keeping the guide wire in place when possible. And um, you can slide the scope over, over the guide wire uh, to, uh, uh, to enter the duct. Here is just a video of accessing the submandibular duct with guide wire. Here's a product duct. For some reason, I, I, I'm having some, uh, yeah, there it is right there. There was a problem with this video. But as you can see with high power magnification, it's quite, uh, quite handy to, to see the ostium to the duct. Uh, in terms of uh, the actual performance of silendoscopy, irrigate gently. You don't want to use too much uh, uh, saline, uh, otherwise you can get significant swelling of the gland. Uh, in terms of uh, using local anesthetic, a very small amount is needed. Usually I use a small amount of lidocaine with epinephrine for the mucosa. And then once I have the scope in place, I inject one to two or instill one to two mLs of clean uh, lidocaine solution, 1%. And often it's more than enough uh, for the, uh, the patient to tolerate a, uh, a diagnostic procedure. Uh, the light intensity does not need to be bright. Oftentimes when the scope is placed, you see a very bright uh, view of the screen. That means that you're, you know, the scope is against the duct. So gently pulling it back to visualize the lumen will allow you to sort of find your place within the duct. Note the interductal findings, record, you know, any abnormalities as it relates uh, in terms of distance from the papilla. So they, as I mentioned earlier, there are markings on the scope, one centimeter markings. So just for, uh, for documentation purposes, it, it, it's good to document where the bifurcations are, where the stenosis is, what is the degree of stenosis. And then as you're doing it, observe for any abnormal flora, mouth or facial swelling that may suggest ductal perforation, at which time it might be uh, best to uh, conclude the procedure and abort uh, to avoid further complications. In the terms of aftercare, stenting, I often stent uh, for uh, after dilation of uh, short segment parotid or distal uh, parotid duct stenosis. And uh, if there is a mid, uh, mid duct sialolithotomy that I per uh, perform, I will stent these. So I'd like to sort of close uh, that, that gap and restore the continuity of the duct. And in this study, uh, it uh, by the uh, Francis Marshall and a group uh, in New Zealand, they looked at whether or not oral steroids improve 
results after, after uh, cell endoscopy for ductal stenosis. And their findings were that if patients received more than seven days of steroids and their, their regimen was 40 milligrams for the first week with a taper, there was a significant reduction in need for revision surgery. So I often give a two week uh, high dose steroid taper for patients that are stented for stenotic disease. Um, anytime I uh, do a sialolithotomy, uh, especially a transoral approach, as well as transfacial, I use antibiotics. Um, sometimes I consider steroids, but not off uh, for the uh, stone cases, but uh, again, mainly for the uh, stenosis cases. Uh, obviously, I have to emphasize hydration and sialogogs um, afterwards. My, uh, uh, that being said, I, I, I tell my patients if, if they have sudden, you know, severe swelling after taking a salagog, just go switch over to a bland diet. So this is the algorithm that I use when I, when I see my patients, uh, uh, when they, if they present with salivary gland swelling and they have ne negative imaging and there's no palpable stone, uh, I offer diagnostic sal endoscopy and then switch over to an interventional uh, approach based on stone size. Stones that are less than five millimeters, a sal, endos a sal endoscopy alone approach is is usually doable. Intermediate size stones between five and eight millimeters often require a little bit more, maybe with laser or a, a, an assisted approach. And certainly stones that are greater than eight millimeters require a, 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 a sal endoscopy assisted open approach. And then uh, for stones that are either intraparenchymal or parotid, uh, maybe challenging uh, to access even with the sal endoscope, conservative management, and if, if their symptoms are, are quite severe uh, in, in, in selected cases, more so in the submandibular gland uh, would offer saladenectomy. So the, just a view, uh, a video of a diagnostic salendoscopy here showing salivary sludge. I'm just gonna go through these videos a little bit quicker because I'm not sure in terms of timing how much we have. This was a patient uh, who had a negative CT scan but his duct was full of salivary stones. Here is an interventional procedure where there is a floating stone encountered within the proximal duct of the submandibular gland. Sorry. And this is just uh, that same stone retrieved with the basket. Here is a uh, sal endoscopy assisted for a submandibular uh, stones. This patient had uh, a distal duct stone and a mid duct stone. So I did a direct sialolithotomy to remove the distal stone. And then with the scope was able to retrieve and bring it distally and just uh, extend the excision and remove both stones through a single uh, sialolithotomy site. Uh, and uh, there I, I placed a stent, I use a, uh, five French pediatric feeding tube. This is a uh, one where the patient under, had uh, an eight millimeter uh, stone in the hilar region of the submandibular gland. This is done under, uh, this is a um, case under uh, general anesthesia. And as you can see here, I've got the sal endoscope. There is some transillumination there at the tip. What I like to do, you, usually is place a vessel loop around the duct as well as the scope to immo immobilize it. It provides a little bit of additional traction. And as you can see right here, there's a stone. And this is very challenging uh, in the absence of, you know, having some of uh, the, the scope uh, assisting uh, its localization. And I have a basket around it. nice to use a nerf hook and sort of tease out the stone. So for large hyalur stones, it, this wouldn't be necessary, but certainly for something like this, uh, it makes it a lot easier. And then this is a patient who underwent a salendoscopy assisted transfacial parotid uh, case. So as I said, I, I start off with uh, trying to engage the stone with a basket holds it in place so there isn't any movement once you open up, uh, do your parotid flap and dissection. 
very small incision initially as I'm getting down. As you can see, there's transillumination from the scope. Use nerve monitoring. After the sialolithotomy is performed, you can see that there's a, uh, there's a stone there. This is under high powered uh, magnification. In her case, the stone was very uh, friable. It fragmented into little pieces. So I was there fishing out uh, a number uh, of, of stone fragments. I'm just gonna fast forward this a little. And once the stones are all out, using the Using the scope, I advance a guide wire to bridge the gap there. So that's the guide wire being passed through into the sort of proximal duct. And then over the guide wire, I place a stent there and secure it. You can see the, the, the stent there. Uh, this is a case of ductal stenosis, actually in a patient with graft versus host disease. You can see that there's a small lumen there. And in this video here, there is some pallor to the duct and I will show you, I'm just going in reverse. Uh, on the way out, this patient actually had a very thin membranous uh, stricture. You'll see the, the membranous portions of just sort of flapping here from the duct wall and he's had complete resolution of his symptoms. He was having chronic symptoms for, for, for years and uh, he was able to take care of this very easily in the office. This is a patient with acute uh, sort of parotid obstruction. Uh, when I say acute, less than three months uh, in a patient with presumptive Sjogren's, she came in with uh, both right-sided as uh, right and left parotid gland swelling and an elevated ANA level. And you can see that there is some pallor to the duct uh, Unfortunately, it doesn't, uh, it was, the, the view was a little dark, uh, but there was, there was an obstruction uh, within the distal duct that I was able to dilate. It was more of a membranous obstruction. Uh, and this patient did very well. I'm just gonna play this other one. The video on the right shows pallor to the duct, but there's the duct bifurcations are a little bit better demarcated and her symptoms were actually less severe on this side. Uh, and so some of the introductal findings correlate very well with the patient's actual symptoms. I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna just pass through. This, uh, this was a patient with chronic uh, Sjogren's, 20 years of symptoms. And you can see that there's uh, the ductal uh, Diameter is more stenotic. There is more pallor. There are complete loss of vascular markings. I can only uh, get in with a 0.8 millimeter scope uh, in, in this patient. And unfortunately for her, I, her symptoms were temporary, temporarily controlled with dilation. Uh, while the stent was in place, she was symptom free. But as soon as the stents came out, her symptoms immediately returned. For her, she had a very good response to Botox injection of her glands. This is just you know, the stark comparison of her parotid gland. And this is actually just an image on the left of her submandibular gland. So very briefly, uh, just a review of the literature. There are a number of meta-analysis and systematic reviews. This larger one, looking at sal endoscopy for stone disease, 19 studies with 1,213 patients, 86% success rate. For a combined approach, there was 374 patients, 93%. Uh, complications were minimal, no permanent nerve uh, injury. Uh, in this study of, uh, in this meta-analysis of 10 studies, including 187, 84 patients undergoing sal endoscopy assisted transfacial approaches for the parotid, they had a 99% uh, stone remo removal rate. Symptom removal uh, uh, rate was 97%, 100% of glands were pre uh, preserved and a complication rate of only 6% and no facial nerve paralysis. And these are all the studies that look at uh, sal endoscopy for uh, non-stone disease, like Sjogren's, RAI-induced sal adenitis, um, juvenile recurrent peritidis. And, uh, you know, they vary between, uh, combined. We're looking at 100 plus patients in each of these studies. 
And uh, for Sjogren's patients, they, they, there was uh, evidence to suggest that there was at least temporary improvement of symptoms, uh, both uh, subjective symptoms, as well as uh, a couple of randomized controlled trials, some improvement in salivary flow between uh, 90 to 99%. This is the, the 90 to 99% is some partial improvement uh, from pooled analysis uh, uh, of the data. Um, I just want to sort of finish off uh, again, because uh, I think I've run over time. Uh, in, just in conclusion, salivary endoscopy is safe and effective minimally invasive gland sparing approach to treating obstructive salivary gland disease. Um, salivary endoscopy alone approaches are appropriate uh, diagnostically, as well as treatment of stones that are less than five millimeters for the submandibular mm -hmm. gland and less than four millimeters for the parotid gland. And these can be performed in the office in carefully selected patients. For larger sized mid duct or distally duct stones, these may be amenable to sal endoscopy assisted approaches or when palpable, just direct sal endoscopy, uh, uh, for uh, can be uh, performed for gland preservation. Uh, sal endoscopy is an excellent diagnostic uh, option for patients uh, with parotid gland obstruction and may offer a therapeutic outcome from them. And uh, offer your patient options and let them decide what is best in their needs. And finally, we are holding our first Harvard Sile Endoscopy Symposium this year, uh, July 16th. Um, I will share some more information uh, with Dr. Uh, Vipin Aurora to share with, uh, with the community uh, once uh, we have the website up and running. So it'd be nice if, uh, if anyone is interested. Uh, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to give this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Vice uh, uh, Rahmati. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, 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 Professor Pasi, there are uh, questions, some, some questions. So I think we can, we can put them to both the speakers. Uh, so first question, uh, Dr. Uh, Vipin already answered, which is the investigation of choice for identifying stones in duct and, and the submandibular gland. Dr. Weiss? Sorry, well, uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I think uh, Dr. Aurora, uh, his answer is absolutely right. I mean, yes. I typically go with CT scan, especially as I mentioned earlier, if the stone is palpable, I will get a, I will get a CT scan uh, to look for size, number, and location of the stones. If it's not, if I don't, if I can't palpate, I offer a diagnostic procedure first, or maybe uh, an ultrasound, uh, especially in younger patients where I want to avoid unnecessary radiation. Okay. Uh, Professor P.P. Singh? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, question was, uh, which is the uh, investigation of choice? Yeah, but in... in uh, uh, very short, we had been depending upon CT scan uh, for confirmation of the stone. And since we started it in GTB, uh, initially you want it, uh, uh, you know, precise location, number, etc., uh, for it to be successful. Later on, of course, now uh, uh, we also believe in, otherwise, internationally, also consensus is that ultrasound could be the first modality, and then uh, you can do diagnostic. But I think as a preference for me, I will do CT scan. Yeah, so CT but scan. I, oh, sorry, I, can I yes. answer, uh, Dr. Ravi may have another question, which probably. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was about to uh, ask that. The, the, the first part of question is uh, how to identify the papilla. Yeah. Any uh, tips? And second part was the, what are the indications of using stent after after ductal ductal intervention of cellular yeah. endoscopy? So uh, about uh, identification, I think we did a study. Uh, this was a thesis of a postgraduate student. We did hundred cases, and if you see the literature, and uh, if you go to let's say Gray's Anatomy uh, and several other uh, anatomy books. Uh, about the location of the punctum of, uh, let us say, submandibular gland. And it is typically described that this is located at the summit of the papilla. And of course, that was not our experience when we started doing the procedure. 
and then we did 100 cases did some measurements of course unfortunately that remained unpublished because uh, it, uh, anyhow so we found that in majority of cases i wouldn't say majority i don't remember the exact figure but in 60 percent of the cases the papilla does not lie on the summit of the papilla the punctum I mean. the punctum does not the opening of the duct does not lie at the summit of the papilla. So I think when you uh, go to an app books, don't believe that statement that it lies at the summit. And uh, when you're trying to locate the papilla, of course, if you don't have a definite or standard landmark, then where do you locate it? And sometimes it's extremely difficult, especially the cement is there. And Dr. Ramthi has also shown you in the slide that you can either milk the duct from uh, backward to forward, but uh, sometimes that also fails. I think we have been using uh, uh, lemon drops even uh, under GA uh, in uh, quite a number of patients when we are not able to locate the papilla. And then sometimes you see a drop or maybe few drops of the, of the, the uh, saliva coming out. And the third is that with the size uh, four zero probe, you, you start gently, uh, the carpeting that area around the papilla, especially posteriorly and laterally. You slowly, slowly, the tip of your probe should be palpating that mucosa, and sometimes you drop in into the duct. And uh, also, which we uh, learned with experience, that uh, where we don't didn't expect it, sometimes this is situated on the medial slope of the papilla. The punctum is situated, and that usually the papilla is. Uh, you know, uh, uh, deviated to the other uh, uh, the midline. So sometimes that that side of the papilla, sometimes you don't examine. So in case of difficulty, just pull the papilla at the summit and then just put it laterally and try to probe with four zero. Or sometimes you can even see the papilla. So these are some of the techniques and. I presented the data, uh, not about this, about 50 cases of our initial cases in 2007 or 8 in Geneva. And uh, like I, 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 the figure was that in 25% of the cases, would, we, we were not able to cannulate the, the quantum. And of course, everybody uh, kind of uh, didn't believe it. They said, no, it cannot happen. But initially, yes, you can have a lot of problems in the, the papilla identification. But I think with experience, it start uh, coming. The last point is that when you are not able to ultimately locate the punctum, uh, don't hesitate to give it in season and just posterior to the papilla and they try to find the distal part of the duct and then make an entry and go from there. Because otherwise, if you, if you don't do that, this is post uh, the, the retropunctal uh, in season and uh, that makes uh, your, your surgery possible and sometimes otherwise you would have come out without it. Uh, doctor? Yeah, about the stent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there was another yes, question sir. about the stent. Uh, as, a, uh, as a general rule, we use stent in all cases where we have dilated strictures, in all cases. And in cases where we have done posterior ductal surgery, like in the hilum, et cetera, again, we have a preference for putting uh, uh, stents. In almost, I would say, all cases of uh, Stenson's duct uh, surgery, we, we put the stent. And in some mandibular gland, as I said, uh, we put it more for posterior stone removal than anterior stone removal. But as Dr. Ahmadi, probably if I got him correctly, that uh, they also use stents for anterior stone as well. So uh, I would say uh, the bottom line for me is that we use much more stents than in uh, most of the centers uh, in India. Okay, uh, Doctor Vice Vice Ramathi, your uh, your ideas, although you have already mentioned in in our presentation, but to reinforce because these are the important tips for the people who who are beginning or who wish to start or in the early phase of their career, as Professor P.P. Singh was telling, almost 25% failure rate. So, any tips you want to reinforce uh, how to find the papilla 
And of they, course, of course. First of all, I, I agree with everything that Dr. Singh said. <laughs> so, it, you know, we're on the same page there. Um, I think, uh, you know, for the beginners, the, the most, one of the important things is you have to be patient, okay? Be patient because it can be very tedious trying to find the, the papilla or the punctum. It is the, it is the rate limiting step here, um, short of trying to do the retropapillary incision and identification of the duct. Uh, but um, as I said, in my personal experience, the thing that was most helpful is, is using high power magnification. So if you have a, a, a microscope, you know, a simple ear microscope or something like that, and you know, you, you, you focus in on that area, most often the, the, the punctum can be identified and, and correct that uh, the smallest of the lacrimal probes, the four zero probes, uh, is, 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 is a great, uh, is the initial starting point. Uh, now, sometimes it is possible that the, uh, that even the four zero, which is I think 0.4 millimeters in diameter is too small or too big. And, uh, so the, the guide wires, the, there are two guide wire sizes that we use and one is 0 0.015 inch. I'm not sure what that is in millimeters. And then there's the standard one that is 0 0.018 inch. And those, that little bit of difference oftentimes accommodates for any stenosis of the punctum and, and, and allows for entry into the duct. And uh, sometimes where the sublingual ridge where the papilla rests just there immediately across from the, the lingual frenulum, it's very floppy. In those patients, it's better to give a very small injection to bleb that uh, the mucosa creates some tension there and then often, if you milk the area, uh, you'll see that the papilla is, is, is visible after that is done. But I, I typically do not inject unless it's kind of like a last ditch effort to try to find it. Um, in, term of the, in terms of stentings, uh, stenting, I tend to also stent most of my patients for the submandibular gland, unless it's a proximal, a proximal hilar stone where I don't think it benefits so much. Uh, but it's more so in the mid-duct stones, I want to restore the ductal continuity. Uh, I don't like the idea of doing uh, a big silo docoplasty and leaving a hole there uh, where food debris and other things can accumulate. So I do stent those. And for the parotid glands, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, any sort of distal or papillary uh, stenosis, any short segment stenosis, so if there is a one centimeter or two centimeter stenosis that can be dilated, I will definitely stent those. But uh, I, as I've seen more and more patients with Sjogren's syndrome, where they have this diffuse uh, you know, stenosis of the ductal system, um, I find that uh, you're probably not helping those patients out. And if it is uh, with dilation and with stenting, and if you do help them, it's very temporary because as soon as, as, soon as the stent comes out, you get this sort of concentric scarring that shuts it all down and their, their symptoms recur. So I, do, I, I tend not to be so aggressive with those patients, but otherwise, yeah, stents for all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I will, I will uh, request uh, my uh, uh, chairperson, Professor, Professor Pasi, if you want uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Rakesh, I have one query from Dr. Ramathi yeah. uh, about the overall prognosis of uh, Sjogren syndrome patients, how frequently the dilatation should be done and how much does it help? What is his experience right. uh, on Sjogren patients? Yeah. So I, I think, we, first of all, we need more data. We need more. Uh, there, uh, there were only six studies th that have been performed for patients with Sjogren's. Uh, I think... Uh, and those, and in those series, those numbers uh, of, of patients in those studies were small. Um, my thoughts are that patients who have uh, a shorter duration of symptoms or a shorter history of, of diagnosis of Sjogren are probably uh, better responders. Um, I certainly offer more cell endoscopy for patients who have obstructive symptoms. Some patients do come in with only xerostomia without obstruction. I, I'm not uh, usually very optimistic that they will have improvement. Although there is a randomized control trial that shows that there is some subjective improvement in the xerostomia um, questionnaires, as well as 
some improved salivary flow uh, post-procedure. But uh, I've also seen a number of patients uh, in my hands that they don't do as well. They, you know, the symptom relief is very temporary. So uh, I think if, if a patient comes in uh, either with symptoms that suggest autoimmune disease, Sjogren's, um, and, and there's been a short duration of existence of those symptoms, definitely offer Sjogren, uh, sal endoscopy uh, for those patients. But some of these patients come in with 10 and 20 years uh, and uh, their primary complaint is xerostomia. And then their secondary complaints may be of maybe some uh, mild tenderness or some mild uh, irregular pain. Uh, for those patients, I'm not as, uh, I, I would offer more of a diagnostic cell endoscopy because perhaps just the, the dilation uh, or uh, you know, the hydrostatic dilation with the irrigation may be beneficial to them at least temporarily, without causing additional harm uh, with, with an aggressive dilation, with stenting and the potential for, you know, uh, for an infection afterwards. Any role of uh, uh, steroids uh, during uh, silendoscopy and dilatation? Absolutely. So Local I do irrigate steroids. all... Yeah, so I, I use Kenalog, Triumph, and I, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I steroids. Use, uh, so within, I, within I, the uh, duct. Correct, correct. So any patient that has inflammatory changes to the duct, if they have salivary sludge, if they have stenosis that I've dilated, I will irrigate with some, some Kenalog, triamcinolone, uh, through the scope uh, to reduce any inflammation within the gland and within the ductal system. Now, the data does not uh, suggest the superiority of using steroids in that context. Uh, it, 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 especially in patients who've had stenosis or autoimmune-related salivary gland obstruction. Uh, patients who underwent steroid ir irrigation did not necessarily do better than those who just went with saline. So I, I think there are a number of studies out there that show that just simple saline irrigation has some therapeutic benefit uh, to patients who, you know, who have obstruction due to Sjogren's, obstruction post-radiation, obstruction post-radioactive iodine, so there, you know, some percentage of patients will see some temporary relief of symptoms um, after just simple irrigation. The, the exact mechanism, I don't think we know. But as I, I, as I mentioned, if you do dilate oral steroids for greater than seven days has shown benefit compared to no steroids or steroids less than seven days. Okay, Thank sir. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, on myself and Professor uh, Pasi's behalf, I thank you both the speakers for the excellent talk and the, uh, and the insight into silo endoscopy. Uh, uh, I think we, we, we hand over the uh, back to AOI office bearer, uh, Professor Harish Taneja, President, and uh, Dr. Vipin, Vipin Aroda, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. And uh, we had two wonderful talks today. Uh, Dr. P.P. Singh's talk was mainly focused on the philosophy of cell endoscopy and the current indication of cell endoscopy. And uh, he uh, gave us insights into that this is a technique which is going to replace the radical surgeries uh, as and when indicated. So thank you, sir, for a, a wonderful talk. And uh, doctor, second talk by Dr. Vai Samati, uh, he walked us through the technical nuances of cell endoscopy, uh, the, uh, how to go about the cell endoscopy, uh, the indications and uh, uh, other uh, uh, technical details. And he also shared some wonderful videos also. So I, I thank you, uh, Dr. Ramati. I thank you a lot uh, for participating in uh, AOI activity. And uh, I thank both the chairpersons, uh, Dr. J.C. Pasi, sir, and uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar, uh, for chairing this session and I thank all the participants and uh, I would request our president Dr. H.C. Dineja to uh, present certificates of appreciation to both the speakers. Thank you Vipin and uh, Association of Photolaryngologists of India, Delhi State award certificate of appreciation to Professor P.P. Singh for delivering an invited lecture 
on paradigm shift in the management of salivary gland pathology, April 30th, 2022. Signed by Dr. Vipin Aroda, Honorary Secretary AOI, Dr. Hitesh Verma, Treasurer AOI Delhi, and myself, Dr. H. Sitaneja, President AOI Delhi. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And the second certificate, yeah, uh, thank you. Yes, second certificate is to uh, Dr. Ramatullah Vais Ramati uh, from Harvard Medical School, Boston, USA, for delivering international invited lecture on cell endoscopy, technical challenges, outcomes, and how to improve results today on April the 30th, 2022. Signed by Dr. Vipin Aroda, Secretary of Delhi, and Dr. Hitesh Verma, President of Delhi, and myself, Dr. S. Sita President. Thank you, Dr. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. So I have just one announcement to make that uh, this was the last session before we bid break for the uh, summer vacations. So the next session will be in the end of uh, July. And uh, I invite all the members who are eligible uh, to become a member of AOI Delhi to uh, be, be a member and support your organization uh, with the this I thank all the participants and uh, can break uh, at this point. Sure. Thank you, Vipin. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.